In the mighty, mighty name of Jesus, amen. Now, I am going to brief our last week's lesson. If, if there's anybody watching who did not see last week's lesson, this is going to kind of build off of that. But I just want to point out one thing, so I'm not going to be able to go into all the detail of that. And then we're going to talk uh, on a, a uh, <laughs> we're going to be talking about grace, but we're going to talk, and it's going to be a little bit heavy. Uh, every once in a while, you, you have to be challenged, and so it'll maybe be challenging and heavy. So I'm going to pick up, though, where I'm going to pull up this uh, first screen. We're talking about our journey in the image of God. We were created in the image of God. We're being transformed and conformed to the image of the Son. Created in the image of God. We're being transformed and conformed to the image of the Son. So that's our, that's our journey. Now these blackboards, I'm going to show the pictures where we've already covered in last week's lesson. And I don't want to take the time on that, but I do want to point out the gap between one board and the other. So now we'll go back to this board. Now this is our first board. And what I showed was we were created in the image of God and the image of God is heart, soul, mind, and strength. And where they all meet together is spirit in the middle. That's the part of us that's the image of God. Then I showed this was Adam in the garden and he's flesh. God breathed into his nostrils the image of God. And so Adam became a living being and he has a body and the image of God breathed into him. But not only that, I pointed out that because I wanted to magnify the repercussions of his fall are bigger than just that he sinned. Now his sin was what opened the door for all of the other repercussions but I want us to understand what God has done in order to rescue us is more than just forgive sin. And forgiving sin was a necessity and it's huge that he forgave our sins. But then the, the, the catastrophic consequences of the sins that Adam committed and all the sins that we've committed is just like compounded. So I, I pointed out last week that this was Adam in the garden, the image of God in a body. But in the garden, God was speaking with him in the cool of the day. In the garden was the tree of life. In the garden was all of the provision. And so we could call the garden at that time. And by the way, Adam was not created in the garden. Adam was created outside of the garden and God brought him into the garden to grow him and to raise him. And so Adam was in a perfect environment, walking and speaking with God in the cool of the day, without sin, without any kind of problem, and access to the tree of life. So then when he sinned, we have this part. When he sinned, we learned last week, not only did he sin, and that was an offense against God, but he sinned, and then we found out that he got booted out of the garden. God kicked him out of the garden and then put an angel to secure the way so that he could not get back into the garden, which is paradise, and so that he could not get access to the tree of life. God said, I don't want him to eat of the tree of life in the condition he's in and live forever. And so there was great loss. Not only did he personally sin, but he also lost access to the tree of life, lost access to the garden, and lost access to walking with God in the cool of the day and hearing God to teach him. God was teaching him and instructing him with the desire that one day he would be conformed to the image of the Son. And this is all pulling from past lessons. But that was not all that he lost. He also ushered in a satanic kingdom. The Bible says that Satan is the God of this age, the God of this world. How did he get there? When Adam fell, 
It's because he negotiated with the evil one, fell for what he chose, and that ushered in a satanic kingdom, a new God. So now Adam did not only lose paradise and the voice of God and the tree of life, he actually exchanged gods. He's now under the rulership of another God in this world. And he's called the prince of the power of the air. He's called, uh, and it says in Colossians that he works in the power of darkness and he has a satanic kingdom. And so all of this happened when Adam fell. So I said that to say, when we, you know, when we talk about, is there anything you could do for your salvation? Could you earn your salvation? Because we're going to talk about grace. But could you earn your salvation? And we say, oh, no, there's nothing. What could you do in exchange for your sins? But our problem is not just sin. Let's just say that you, that because Adam did get forgiven, by the way. Remember, God killed animals, starting animal sacrifice, which was a type of, of the Lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world. And God covered Adam's nakedness. So therefore his sins were covered. But he was still out of the garden. He was still under the dominion of another God. He was still having to live his life out in another kingdom. So when we say, what would you give for your salvation? Or what could you do for your sins? It's not just an issue of sins. It's not just an issue of, of um, what am I going to give for my sins? It's an issue of how do I get out of this kingdom? How do I get out of this? I'm covered. This is Adam. I'm covered in the skins where God himself performed the sacrifice of the animal and covered me with the skins. I tried covering myself with the fig leaves. That didn't work. But God himself covered my nakedness. But I'm still in another kingdom. How can I get out of there? So I'm wanting us to see what God has done for us is far bigger than just forgiving us for our sins. Although forgiving us for our sins is no small task. If you've ever heard me teach on what Jesus had to do in order for our sins to be forgiven, but, but I am saying there's a dilemma here. So now I want us to go over to our other board and then kind of introduce, and then we're going to go into our lesson. Okay. So then what we have over here is we have what happened to us when we were born again. In order to get out of the sons of Adam, you had to die out. You're no longer a descendant of the first Adam. Your spirit your spirit man is no longer under Satan's dominion. You are born into the kingdom of the Son. So this is what happens when you get born again. So God birthed us again. But though he birthed us again, we are still living in a world where Satan is the God of this age. So we have a clash of two kingdoms. We are now birthed into a new kingdom that is here but not totally manifest yet. Then we have a satanic kingdom. So I'm, this is just our dilemma. And not only that, we are also still in the first Adam's flesh. Now we have been birthed again. The image of God on the inside of us has been set free to become, but we're still in Adam's flesh, still in Satan's kingdom. Now I'm saying this because now I want to deal with an issue of grace because I'm going to begin to present, if this is true, how should we then live. This is the issue that I'm wanting to address because we're going to deal with practical outworking of if this is true and the other board is where we came from, how does God expect us? What does he expect of us now? This is what we're going to deal with, but we're going to have to deal with the issue of grace. 
Now I want to come over here and get another screen up. So give me a minute. All right, and I'm going to pull this slide up where you can see this. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to deal with the issue of grace because in our next few lessons, I'm going to deal with what God expects from us. But in order to get you to <laughs> be open to receive it, if you've been influenced by the traditional Western church's view of grace, then you're probably going to repel against the way I'm going to present what God expects from us. God has done so extraordinarily above and beyond for us, and he has expectations in this life. He expects from us some things. Now, because of the general view of grace today, people say, and, and this is the, the this is going to be the heart core of what I'm going to present tonight is, is this. Should we obey God or do we have to obey God? Now, I'm going to say probably 90% of the church believes we should obey God, but we don't have to. And you don't really want to say that, although that's what you mean, you don't really want to say that because then that sounds like we don't have to obey God. And that is really what most people believe. Most Christians believe you don't have to obey him. You probably should. But because the salvation we have is by grace, you don't have to. Now, you might lose a few gold nuggets when you stand before him because you didn't, but hey, you made it. The alternative was hell, so you're still a winner. So should you obey God? Yeah, do you have to? Really? No, you don't have to. Now, that's what I'm saying. This is what we believe, although most people would never say that. Just blatantly, like I'm saying, that to say you don't have to obey God. Oh, no, no, you have to, but... As, as I heard a man say one time, the theology people profess and the theology people live are not always the same. People say, oh, you got to obey God. So you live a life like that? No, I'm just saying you ought to. And so it changes back and forth. So what I'm going to deal with is I want to deal with the, the definition of grace and hopefully get, get through, <laughs> I can see we're not going to get to the end, but we're going to deal with grace first. We're going to spend some time defining grace or redefining grace. Now, there's an oversimplified definition of grace, that, and, and we just have adopted this, and it's called unmerited favor. Unmerited favor, undeserved favor. That is true but it's only a piece of the truth about grace. So I want us to look, and then we're going to read a parable that Jesus told that I believe will make clear what we need to come to grips with. Then when we hit the practical things that I'm going to say, number one is you need to be transformed into the image of the Son. Not an option. It is the command of God, the desire of God. That's the truth. Not an option. We are to be changed into the image of his son. That's number one. Number two, it's by grace. It is by grace. But if you misunderstand that, you look at it as that's something God is going to do when I get to the other side. And between now and then, he doesn't see how I really am because he's looking through the eyes of grace. And so, though I'm out robbing banks and murdering, he doesn't see it. He looks at me and says, 
I see Jesus. Okay, this is a terrible, terrible misunderstanding and skewing of grace. And we are going to be held accountable. So let me pull up this slide and then we're going to walk through a couple of things that I hope are going to make this clear. Now what we're going to do, I'm going to read three uh, lines about grace and then we're going to try to understand and make sure we're grasping what I am saying and what I believe to be the truth. According to the Word of God, we're going to look. Number one, grace is, it's unmerited favor, that definition works, but grace is help or favor from God. Now, now listen carefully. To do for, through, or in, you and I, what we can't do for or by ourselves. So now listen, grace is help and favor from God to do for, through, and in us what we can't do for or by ourself. So the first one was going back to the blackboards. That's why I showed those at the beginning. To leave the kingdom of darkness, to forsake Satan as the God of this world and to be able to live in the kingdom that has come, not fully yet, that is not something that you and I could have done. The Word of God says we've been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of His Son. That is grace. That's something we couldn't have done if God even told us, here's what you need to do. We just couldn't have done it. It is a literal miracle to be translated out. That is grace. See, that's something we couldn't do. It's something that had to be done in us, to us, and through us. It had to be done. But it's something we couldn't do. That is grace. So that's something God did that is grace. That's why I showed those blackboards. But I want us to then go and look at some other aspects of grace. And then, of course, there's a, a lot of things that maybe we'd hit them in questions and answers if I, don't, if I don't make something clear. But there's a couple of other points that I want to point out about grace that I think are, are terribly misunderstood. So let's go back to our slide. Number two, grace is not help or favor for what you could but will not do. God is not gracious so that we can get by not doing what we don't want to do. Mercy, <laughs> thank you Jesus for mercy, mercy does step in sometimes when we have not done what we should do and will not do what we should do and God is merciful and comes in and helps us, that's mercy. Mercy is not giving us what we deserve. Grace, though, is helping us to do or become or whatever it takes is necessary for us to fulfill the journey and the desire of God that is beyond us. Okay, that's number two. Now, number, uh, oh, and I wrote two and two again, but this is the second two. Okay, number three. Now, this is the biggie. This is the one that, that, that everybody gets hung up on. Now, listen, grace is not opposed to works. Now, we're going to look, we're going to see this, we're going to read some, we're going to read through a, a whole section of, of scripture. Grace is not opposed to works. It is opposed to, now listen, it is opposed to earning or deserving grace. Grace is not opposed to works. Grace is opposed to earning grace 
or deserving grace. We have made an enemy of works. Now, here's why I'm saying this before we go into the verses we're going to read. We have made an enemy of works, and here's what I'm going to tell you. If you are going to be transformed into the image of the Son, if you're going to be conformed to the image of the Son, which is God, what God, those whom He foreknew, He predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, it's God's will that every believer be conformed to the image of His Son. Well, let me tell you something. You will not be transformed nor conformed to the image of the Son without hard work. I am telling you, it is work. But grace is not opposed to work. Grace is opposed to earning or deserving grace, favor from God. You can't earn favor from God. You can't deserve favor from God. So back to our blackboards. When Adam received the forgiveness for his sin, which was catastrophic, when he received forgiveness for his sin and God clothed him with the animal skins, did he deserve to be translated into the kingdom of his dear son? No. Did he earn to be translated into the image, I mean, into the kingdom of his dear son? No. That was grace. But what was one of the things God said? Adam, you are going to work. But God had commanded him to work before he ever sinned. Work is part of life with God. And, and if you don't get this in your head, in your, in your heart, in your mind, no, not head, heart, soul, mind, and strength. If we don't grasp this, that we have to work. I'm talking work. This is labor. Paul said it this way. I beat my flesh to keep it under. Well, I don't think he did, you know, like we see those religions where he, he took a stick and walked around beating himself on the back. That's not what he's saying. He's saying what Jesus said. If your right eye offends you, pluck it out. If your right hand offends you, cut it off. Is he really saying pluck out your eye? Really saying cut off your hand? He's saying no. Take drastic measures, whatever it takes to prevail, do it. Oh, Lord, I'm just sitting back just trusting in your favor. I'm just trusting in your favor. Well, you better pluck your eye out. You better cut your hand off. Now, I'm not literally saying pluck your eye out. Those are statements. Paul saying, I beat my flesh to keep it under. What was Paul saying? What was Jesus saying? He's saying, you are still in a kingdom where darkness rules. There is a God of this age, and you're living in the flesh that still belonged to the fallen Adam. You have been birthed again, but you have a battle in front of you, but you also have an obligation in front of you. My father expects you to be conformed to my image in this life. Now listen, what did the apostle Paul say? Not as though I have attained and, and yet not as though I've been perfected, but I press towards the mark. I'm not talking about being perfect. I am simply saying this pill we've swallowed of grace that says, since I have been translated into the kingdom of his dear son, I can now sit back, put my feet on the desk and just say, whoo, I wonder when the rapture is so that I can stand before the Lord. A lot of us might be not so happy that we're going to have to stand before the Lord, especially if there's people in front of the line of us and we see how he deals with them. And they were like, whoa, uh, is there any way I can get out of this line and go back and finish what I was supposed to do? Now, I know this is sobering, but listen, I want to show you. So let's go to another slide here. Now, this is the Apostle Paul. 
Listen to Paul concerning work, laboring. Besides that he already said, I beat my flesh to keep it under. 1 Corinthians 15, 9. For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But, listen to this, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Now listen to this one. And his grace. Now just think of the two blackboards. His pulling me out of the kingdom of darkness and translating me into the kingdom of his dear son. Him birthing me again so that the image of God that's on the inside of me is free to become. He did this. Now listen to what Paul's saying. And his grace towards me was not in vain. What's he saying? He's saying, I did something with it. I did something with it. Really, Paul? I thought we were saved by grace, not by works. You are saved, translated out of the kingdom of darkness and your spirit that God created in you when you came into this world. God has freed the, your, your spirit, man. God has freed you. That is grace. He's translated you out of darkness. That is grace. But listen, the question is, can we answer like Paul and say, God's grace towards me was not in vain. Why, Paul? What does he say? I labored more abundantly. That's the word for work. I worked more abundantly than they all, meaning all the apostles. And this word means all of them together. Paul is saying, I labored harder than all of them together. Now listen, but he says, yet not I, but the grace of God, which is within me. But Paul's the one who said, I beat my flesh to keep it under. So what I'm wanting us to see here is we, I want us to understand this balance of <laughs> working and the grace of God working together. Now, what we're going to do, I'm going to pull up a parable. Now, this one was too long to put because I would have had 15 slides and I don't want to do that. So I want us to go to Luke. If you got your Bibles, Luke chapter 19, and I'm going to scroll up here and I want to read through. And this one is the parable of the Minas. They're they're. That's a smaller sum of money. Now, I want to read to you the words of Jesus. And listen, folks, I know there's a whole group of people that don't even believe the words of Jesus matter now because they believe what Jesus spoke before the cross is irrelevant to the believer because after the resurrection, the things Jesus spoke before are irrelevant. There's a whole group of believers who believe that. It's nonsense. Because he said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will remind you of the things that I spoke that you're now calling irrelevant. But nonetheless, so let's, let's look here at Matthew, I mean, at Luke chapter 19. I'm going to read through this. And if you've got your Bibles, you can follow along with me. And we're going to start in verse 11. And listen to what he says. Now, as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately, meaning in its fullness. Therefore, he said, now, if you have your um, Bibles that have red letters in them, so these are, these are the words that Jesus said that we are told by Luke. A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and return. So he called 10 of his servants. Now, let me just say this too, without going into the teaching on the, the parables, but the parables, in one of the parables, it says, Jesus spoke to them in parables because the parables spoke of things to do with the kingdom from before the foundation of the world. So when Jesus is telling parables, he's telling us things about the kingdom. The one that we pray, thy kingdom come. It is coming. And now Jesus is telling us something about the kingdom. So now listen to what he says. 
A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called 10 servants. Everybody say to yourself right now, I qualify as a servant. So he called 10 servants to himself and delivered to them 10 minas. And this is about a pound. We don't know a pound of what. Could have been silver, could have been gold, could have been copper coins. But he gave them about a pound each. Now, this means each one got one pound. Okay? So this is going to become important. But I'm wanting to communicate to us about grace. Notice grace. What is grace? It's helping you in something you couldn't do for yourself. So notice this, verse 13. So he called 10 of his servants and delivered to them 10 minas or minas, the, the one pound bag of coins of some sort. So now listen, what did they do to get that bag of money? Nothing. They were just his servants. So he is now by grace giving these 10 servants a pound of coins each. They didn't do anything for it. They're just his servants, just like you and me. But I want us to see when God gives something, he has expectation for us to work something. Now listen. So he called 10 of his servants and delivered to them 10 minas and said to them, do business till I come. Notice he didn't tell them what kind of business to do. He said, do business, work with what I give you. Do business till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man reign over us. So it, it doesn't go well for them at the end. Okay. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom... He then commanded these servants, remember what I had you say, I am a servant. I am a servant of the king. So when he had received his kingdom, he then commanded his servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know how much every man or person has gained by trading, by working. Then came the first saying, Master, your mina has earned 10 more minas. And listen to what he said to him. He said to him, why, you ungodly servant, don't you know that you should not have labored with the gifts I gave you? You should have sat back and let them prosper by grace. Notice he didn't say that. Listen, listen to what he said. He came to the first and he said, Master, your minna has earned 10 others. And he said to him, well done, good servant, because you were faithful in very little, taking what I have given you and doing something with it. Now listen, because you were faithful with very little, have authority over 10 cities. And then the second came to him, Master, your minna has earned five minas. Notice this guy did not earn as much as the other one, but there is no reprimand, no comparison from one to another. Paul said those who compare themselves among themselves are fools. So notice this. He, he says, Master, your minna has earned five other. Likewise, he said to him, you also will be over five cities. But notice that the work that he did earned something. Now, what was our definition of grace? Is grace against earning? No, grace is against earning grace. Grace is not against earning. God wants us working and earning. And I don't mean just money. God wants us working what he gave us. 
God wants us bearing fruit. Notice he does not reprimand them by saying, oh, why didn't you sit back and just let me do all this by grace? If God is against earning, why is he praising these people for earning? God is against earning grace. By grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it's a gift of God. You can't earn the gift of God, but with the gift of God, you can be fruitful. Now listen, likewise he said to him, you will be over five cities. Notice that how fruitful he was determines some of his future. Oh, I thought everything God gives us in the future is just a big grace bowl. It's just a big bowl of grace. God has called me to be conformed to the image of his son. And when I get on the other side, he's just going to dump it all on me. And they're going to say, whoa, look at that transformation. It happened in the blink of an eye. Apparently, this king who returns and is bringing his kingdom, apparently he's saying what you labored in dictates some of what you have on the other side. That's not what you received by grace. What you received by grace was what you started with. What are you doing with it? So the 10 city, the 10 talent guy or the 10 minas guy, the 10 pounder got ruled 10 cities. The five pounder got to rule five cities. Was that by grace? Yes, it was by grace that God gave him the bag to start with. But it was by work that he produced. Now listen, in case you're thinking, I'm talking about working out in the world, which we do need to be working, amen. It's a command of God. But that's not my point. My point is the grace of God that God has put the image of God on the inside of us, the Holy Spirit on the inside of us with his desire that we be conformed to the image of his son. And we're sitting back, coasting on that and saying, I'll let God impute it to me when I get on the other side. I'll just wait and see what I look like when I get there. Why work at this thing? Why cut my right hand off? I might need it. Why pluck my right eye out? I might need it. I might not be able to play golf as good with only one eye. Mm. Okay, now listen. Oh, well, all right. <laughs> Verse 20. So he said, be over five cities. Verse 20, then another came saying, master, and, and by the way, notice that there's only three here. We don't know what happened. He gave to 10 different people. We don't know what happened to the others. Maybe they were similar and this is just all that we're told because we can assume some made two, five, seven, whatever. But notice this one. Then another came saying, master, here is your mina, which I have kept and put away in a handkerchief. Uh oh, listen to this. For I feared you because you were an austere man. And this word austere could be described in the verse of God that says to us that we are to know the kindness and severity of God. Austere means, in the, the, the Greek word here, it means tough. Tough as nails. I'm not playing a game. I was expecting fruit. This is not a game. I'm expecting fruit. Now, this is what the man acknowledged and said, I know you're the kind of guy that expects fruit, but I was afraid. So now listen to this. For I feared you because you were an austere man expecting fruit and you, you there was no, you, you don't play. And you, now listen to this, and you collect what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. So now... These words are saying, I also realize that you can go into impossible 
situations and produce. As I say to people, God can cause an apple tree to grow on a rock in the middle of a desert. This is what this guy's saying. I realize you're the type of guy that can go and get a rock and plant an apple tree on a rock and it grow. Listen to what Jesus says. And he said to him, because remember the first part, this is why I chose this one over Matthew. The first part was they were in hostile world. Remember the people said, we don't want this guy ruling over us. Talking about Jesus. Talking, he's the one that's gone to get the kingdom and to come back with it. We don't want that. So these 10 guys were operating in hostile territory. This should be an encouragement to us. And I realize it's a heavy, but this should be an encouragement to us. We need to be strong, bold, and courageous. And I heard this definition from a pastor friend in West Virginia, Mike Lenz. He said, courage is not to be without fear. Courage is the willingness to disregard your fear and go ahead anyway. This is what this guy was not willing to do. He was afraid and did nothing. He knew I'm, I'm serving an austere man, one who can be severe. What if I lose his mina? So listen, you collect where you did not deposit, you reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, out of your own mouth, I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew I was an austere man collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow that I could grow a tree on a rock in the middle of a desert. You knew that. If you'd done anything with it. Listen. Ver, uh, verse 23. Why then did you not put my money in the bank that I might at my coming have collected it with at least interest. In other words, if you're not going to do something with the talents that God has given you, give your talents to somebody that'll do something with them. But he didn't. He buried. Now, I'm putting this in the context, but wait, hold on. I got to, I got to tell the end. And then he said to those who stood by, take the one mina from him. The one who wouldn't do anything with it because he was afraid. Take the one mina from him and give it to him who has 10. And listen, they protested. But they said to him, Master, the guy with 10 already has 10. That's more than any of us. Listen to what he says. God loves fruitfulness, folks. God loves change. God loves people who go after change. God loves it when we pursue without regarding fears. What if I fail? What if I decide I am going to go all in and chase after God and I fail? Number one is you won't. But number two is die trying. Listen to what he says though, folks. This is sobering. For I say to you, this is after they whined about him giving it to the guy with the most. For I say to you that every one of you who has will be given if he uses what he has and from him who does not have even what he has will be taken away from him. And then he says, bring those enemies of mine that didn't want me to reign over them and slay them before me. Now I want to read the verse, the end of Matthew 25. And, and then we're going to in there with hopefully a little, little sum up, just because I want us to see the severity of God. God is kind. He's good. He's merciful. Okay. Um, this is to the guy who was afraid to do anything, but his Lord answered him and said, now this is Matthew 25, 26, but his Lord answered him and said to him, you wicked, lazy servant. Lazy's not good. Now listen, you can be a hard worker at your job and lazy concerning the change into the image of the sun. Most people that are unproductive towards transformation, one is because they don't believe they need to. 
Ah, don't worry, God's going to dump it all when you get on the other side. It's all by grace, brothers, by grace. Grace is God helping and doing in, through, and for you what you can't do. Notice that he doesn't take the guy with the five talents and say, here, by the way, since it's obvious that you were not able to produce more than five and be a ruler of five cities, I, by grace, will give you ten. No, by grace, I gave you five cities, but that's what you worked at. You worked at. Now listen, but the Lord said, you wicked, lazy servant, you knew I reap where I have not sown, you gather where I have not scattered seed. I can grow the tree on the rock in the middle of a desert. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers. So at my coming, I would have at least received back my own with interest. Now listen. So take the talent from him. What if this parable of the talent is talking about favor God has given us for the journey of transformation? Just saying, what if? What if these talents could be exchanged for favor? Because these talents were given by favor to begin with. He just picked them out and gave them to them. So what if the grace favor of God is treated like a talent? And listen to what he says. So take from him the talent and give it to him who has 10 talents. For everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But for him who does not have, have what? Fruit from working at it. Okay, let me get a hold of myself. Okay. <laughs> for everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But for him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away and cast, listen, the unprofitable servant. Now, remember what I had you say at the beginning? I'm a servant of the Lord. Cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, folks, I tell people, outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth is not the poor part of heaven. Now, did I say that to scare you? No. I said that to encourage us for the journey. And here's why. God was not upset. The, 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 whole, the, whole, the whole creation is his. God was not upset about the fruit not enough being produced in the sense that he wanted more money. God was saying, I have done what I showed on the blackboards. I have translated you from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of my son. I have filled you with my Holy Spirit. I have birthed you again. Even the prophets of old sought to see your day. They looked forward. What will the day like be when I pour out my spirit upon all flesh? They were staggered by the thought. What will it be like when God has poured out his spirit upon all flesh? God has poured out such talents on us. I don't mean talents of gold. And some people have talents of money and these things. God has given everybody, but God has given everybody who's a servant of his. The ability to be transformed into the image of his son. But because of our view towards grace, our view towards works, and, and listen, if you do not work at it, you will not attain. Paul did not even attain, and he said, I outworked all the other apostles put together. By the grace of God, I labored. God gave me the goods, and I worked all I could. This is why when he reached the end of his life, he said, my time of departure is at hand. I have run the race. I kept the faith. There is therefore laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Why? Because I sat back and said, ah, don't worry. When you get to the other side, it's all imputed. No, but because I was willing to cut my hand off if it offended me, pluck my eye out if it offended me, to do whatever it took, I pressed towards the mark. 
Now, folks, what I'm not saying is that we are to compare ourselves to each other, nor be afraid of failing. That's the thing that in both of these, the Lord condemned the man for being afraid of failing. He said, I was afraid. You would think, well, the Lord said, well, you ought to be afraid of me. You were afraid of what? Well, I know you, you don't make mistakes. You always hit a home run. What if I got up and struck out? At least you would have swung the bat. But you did nothing. Now, I'm saying this. You need to read both of these parables. You need to listen to what they say. They're full of grace. And then labor with what God gives us. And I'm focusing not on our businesses, and, 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 but you ought to trust God for those too. And listen, that's why I read that one in Luke. Hostile territory. People who said we don't, just like our nation, we don't want that king ruling over us. Guess what? Some still produce 10. Some five, and we don't know about the others. Don't hide what God gave you. Don't bury it. God has filled us for change. God has filled us for change. Use whatever resources you've got and say, Lord, I am determined to be conformed to the image of your son. I am determined. Well, yeah, but every time I make a determination, I drop the ball. Then get up and go after it again. This is what he's saying. You know what? We don't know if the guy who earned 10, that he might have earned 50 and then lost 40 before the king came and only had 10 left. We don't know. I know this because I know life is tough and I know this journey is full of knockdowns and falling down. A righteous man falls seven times, but he gets up again and he presses towards the mark. And so when I talk about these things that we got to do, listen, I'm going to tell you, you have to do these. One of them is prayer. If you don't have a prayer life, you better start. You have to pray. If you want to be conformed, if you want to be transformed into the image of his son, you got to have a prayer life. If you don't know how to pray, then find out, ask. Do whatever it takes. You need a prayer life. That's just one of the things. But I'm saying, listen, that's not an option if you want to add it on like air conditioning in a car or power windows. No, this is, we're going to give an account. He's going to say, I filled you with the Holy Spirit. I birthed you. I freed the image of God that was taken bondage by the evil king in this world. I freed you. You are a free person. I also brought you into the kingdom and the kingdom is here. What'd you do with it? Well, Lord, I was afraid. We're living in hostile America today. So what? So, okay. I wanted to emphasize. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I wanted to emphasize our responsibility to labor with the grace God has given us. It's the grace of God that we can pray. But it's our willingness to cut the hand off that stops us from praying. To pluck the eye out that stops us from praying. Folks, we can do this. God would not ask us to do this if we couldn't do this. Those whom he foreknew, he predestined, he predetermined. This is the path I want every one of my sons to take. I want them to conform to the image of my only begotten son. Every one of them. Well, Lord, I'm just a so-and-so. Every one of them. And to me, this is... This is Obviously, I feel like this is one of the most important things today is that God's people pursue the image of his son because if we're all living to the best we can, pursuing the image of his son, then a lot of the other things we're concerned about, Lord, should I do this? Should I do that? That'll take care of itself. 
will be led of the Spirit. That's another thing we have to do. Okay, I'm going to stop there. I didn't say this to be discouraging, but I do want you to be sobered. You are going to give an account, and you're going to stand in a line. I'm saying based on at least how I think. We're going to stand in a line, and we're going to come before Him. And something that this actually happened to me in a vision. But as I was standing in line, I didn't know what line I was in. And then as I got closer, I realized, oh my goodness, that is the Lord. And I'm going to give an account. And by the way, I have that written on my living room wall in magic marker. You will die and you will give an account so that I read it every day. Another one is your call is holy. And another one is it's better to lose your life. It's better to lose your life than to waste it. You don't want to waste what God has deposited in us. But nonetheless, I was standing in this line. And as I got closer, I realized what line I was in. And my heart started beating. And I was like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. I don't have anything to give. Oh my goodness. And so right now, you know, we're down here and we're saying, oh, I don't care. I don't care. I'll just be glad to get there. You're going to stand before the austere king into whose hands all judgment has been given. And he's going to say, I paid a dear price. The greatest price that's ever been paid for anything. I paid so that you could be conformed to my image to please my father. What have you done? So we need to be, we need to pray. Amen.